Hello class. Welcome back to EDC 2002. Today we're going to be covering low pass filters uh, in review and then talking about how to design passive high pass filters today. So uh, as we'll learn, high pass filter design is uh, going to build on the same concepts as low pass filter design. Uh, in fact, we're even going to transform a high pass design problem into a low pass design problem. So it's a good chance to reinforce what we learned yesterday. Before we get started, do we have any questions about the course other than any sort of like specific questions about problems on the exam? Still waiting on a couple people to take the exam. No questions? OK. We'll start lecturing. So last time we talked about brick wall diagrams, which are almost made to be confusing because instead of plotting the magnitude response, they plot attenuation, which is the negative of the magnitude response. So, you know, I'll start at zero for, uh, you know, basically passing through unchanged and they get higher and higher for signals that are attenuated. So this, this pass band is, you know, nice, you know, brick wall goes nice and low and the pass uh, stop band brick wall goes fairly high. In between we have our transition band, but we, we get four points of interest, omega P, omega S, A max, the maximum attenuation allowed in the pass band and A min, the max, the minimum attenuation allowed in the stop band. And just to be confusing, A max is less than A min because of these definitions. So whatever filter we design, it cannot have its attenuation pass through the sort of red walled off regions. Uh, if it does, that means we don't meet the specifications. We've got to change our procedure, uh, double check our work. Uh, so anything that just, you know, skirts around it is okay. Uh, and we contend that these four specifications are enough to specify any sort of low pass filter uh, once given to the engineer uh, with the Butterworth design uh, process. So we need to choose, you know, the gain is normalized. So, you know, we just treat gain equals to one unless uh, told otherwise. Uh, the order end of the Butterworth filter controls roll off and then the cutter off frequency omega C uh, is, you know, somewhere between omega P, omega S, usually uh, it determines, you know, how, uh, uh, where this, you know, pole is where we have uh, 3 dB occur. Because uh, you can say a max is something that's not equal to 3 dB, in which case your math gets a little bit harder depending on how you wanted to find the pass band. Uh, again, these were hard calculations that weren't possible on a slide roll, which was kind of, you know, uh, a interesting, but not very useful to the average engineer at the time. But as computers got more sophisticated, available, uh, and then went from mainframes to pocket calculators, uh, you know, this process kind of became available to anyone. So the low pass filter design process is five steps. We choose the minimum order of the filter, choose the cutoff frequency, choose the appropriate transfer function for the normalized filter response, uh, select a known circuit structure, implement the transfer function, and then we magnitude scale to match the known resistance, or, and then we frequency scale to achieve the target omega C. So you do a lot of math uh, very carefully and you get that this formula a min is equal to log of 10 to the a min over 10 minus one uh, over 10 to the a max, should say a max right here, divided by 10 minus one, all over twice the logarithm of omega s to omega p. And you just choose the next largest integer, you do all this math, you'll get something like uh, uh, 4.63, and then the next largest integer would be five because you don't want to implement a higher order filter than you need to. Uh, then we, you know, get the range that the cutoff frequency must be in between, uh, you know, 
and we can choose any convenient value in between these two bounds uh, for omega c. I like to choose a nice rational number. Uh, I recommend you do the same. And again, notice that you know these are fairly complicated expressions that depend on the order you just chose, uh, and you know taking ten to a power. Then we choose the Butterworth polynomial to go into the denominator of our transfer function. Because remember, it's really hard to go from the magnitude response right here, which is sort of the mathematical Butterworth filter, into uh, a, an actual working backwards into the transfer function it does in terms of s, not just magnitude of h of j omega. And we'll use these standard form polynomials on the right in order to figure it out. Notice for the fifth order one, the golden ratio makes an appearance, which is uh, interesting for some people. And if you want to think about the silver ratio, the silver ratio makes an appearance in the fourth order polynomials, so on and so forth. Then we said we're going to focus on the Cower topology, which is alternating capacitors and inductors in order to actually implement a circuit that, you know, uh, achieves this transfer function. Um, you know, there's a problem of using inductors and high order filters because of precision. Uh, so we're going to focus on the first foreign lecture, though you can make higher order filters in practice. You just have to be very cautious when doing it and the design process gets rather tedious. There's all sorts of online calculators you can take advantage of uh, to help this out. Then there's also the sound and key topology, which uses op amps, resistors, and capacitors, which we'll talk about later. The downside be there being that you need op amps, which are a little bit more expensive than resistors or capacitors. Uh, but you know they behave fairly ideally over a very wide range of frequencies. So we talked about the known RS and RL, where we compared the transfer function, then we match terms. Uh, similar to problem three on exam two, you match terms to determine what the component value should be. So you have to make sure you get the exact same form of your transfer function. And then, you know, one over RSC matches one. So RSC equals one second. Or L over RL equals one second. Or LC equals one second squared. And then L over RS equals one over squared to two seconds. So on and so forth. Uh, up to the second cubes and one over second squared and seconds. And, you know, these monstrosities with the fourth order circuits, which, you know, you can, you can solve these, but they're, they're getting a little bit complicated uh, to say the least. Though I think, you know, if, if an engineer were so motivated, you could sort of reason your way through why the things appear in the, in the third order circuit. You know, you can say, okay, you got to have everyone involved in the constant term. You, you have your leading time constant, you know, bandwidth type idea, attenuation type idea in the square term. And then this term is like an interaction of all the reactive components. It gets a little bit harder to reason out what everything should be for a fourth order circuit, to say the least. That takes us to today. What questions do we have? No questions? OK. We'll reinforce some of these ideas and do an example which will, uh, of a high pass filter, which we said will also help us cement the ideas of low pass filters. So slide 25, new slide for today. Conceptually, the transfer function of a high pass filter, our HPF, is the multiplicative inverse of a low pass filter. So wherever we had omega over omega C, now we're gonna have omega C over omega. That's what we're trying to say here. So I'll just you know skip uh, most of the motivation and say okay we want high pass filters for some reason uh, you know we're going to get a brick wall specification brick wall diagram and then we'll say convert the high pass design filter or high pass filter design problem to a low pass filter design problem solve for the order of the high pass filter as a low pass filter design the normalized low pass filter as before go through those steps frequency scale by omega c 
uh, convert circuit elements. This is the key step number five right here because it's what turns it from the low pass filter back into a high pass filter. And then lastly, do your magnitude scaling. So that's normally a quick step. So as you can see, most of these are just a, a rehash of the low pass filter problem. Uh, we just need to take the time to convert the high pass filter problem into a low pass filter problem. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, we note that the brick wall diagram is mirrored. So let's go back to the brick wall diagram on slide nine. So now the attenuation in decibels is gonna to go to zero as omega gets very large. So this sort of figure right here uh, with this brick wall would be mirrored to the other side. And you know we want the uh, attenuation to get close to zero as omega gets very large. And the attenuation in dB is appreciably large for omega approaching zero. The stop band is on the other side. So we want this stop band brick wall over here so that our transfer function you know, starts high, goes low, and you know, gets asymptotically close to uh, A equals zero. So back to slide 26. So what we're going to do is define normalized frequency, capital omega. We define omega before for low pass filters as omega over omega C. This time, since uh, we said it's the multiplicative inverse, the normalized frequency for a high pass filter is omega C divided by omega. So now omega lives in the denominator, which is a little bit weird, but makes sense. So that omega equals one is always the cutoff frequency. And this is where I must say, I'm going to teach this differently than what the textbook does. So, you know, heads up to people who have been following along with the textbook. You know, the textbook defines this differently. They use the passband frequency and then they introduce correction factors later on. Uh, I like to keep the definitions consistent. So normalized frequency will always be defined relative to the cutoff frequency rather than uh, depend cutoff frequency for low fast filters and passband uh, upper bound frequency for high pass filters. To me, that's confusing. Might as well just stick to uh, one convention that always uses the cutoff frequency, even though we don't know what the cutoff frequency is. That may seem a little confusing, a little jarring, but don't worry, it'll work out. So while H of J omega is a high pass filter, right? H of J capital omega is a low pass filter that can be designed exactly the way we did before. The pass band is zero less than omega, capital omega less than capital omega sub P, and stop band is capital omega sub S less than capital omega less than infinity. You know, if you know that confuses you, well, we did take a multiplicative inverse in log, in log land, you know, that's going to uh, be the same as a reciprocal in the side the logarithm which is a negative one out front. So that, you know, reverses all these inequalities uh, to the normal low pass filter ones. So the upper bound of the normalized pass band is omega P, which is omega C sub omega P. And the lower band of the normalized stop band is omega sub S is omega sub C over omega sub S. What questions do we have? You're going to think of resistance. Well, we're not using it as a unit. The unit of omega is, you know, unitless because it's a frequency divided by a frequency. So try not to think of, try not to think of ohms. Try to think of normalized frequency. <laughs> Remember, R is this R is the symbol for resistance. So we already derived the relationship for the minimum order of a Butterworth low pass filter. We just have to remember to use the normalized frequencies of the brick wall specifications. Remember to focus integer. Again, it's the exact same formula as before. This bottom one, cross out A min, write A max instead. That's a typo. 
And you might be worried, wait a minute, Omega S, uh, Omega P, right now they're defined using uh, Omega C. How do we possibly uh, get a number out of this? It looks like we can have a variable. But since we're taking Omega S divided by Omega P, we get Omega C over Omega S, all over Omega C divided by Omega P. The Omega Cs cancel out. So we get that capital Omega S divided by Omega capital Omega P is just Omega little Omega P over little Omega S, which those are numbers that were given to us as part of our brick wall specification. So we can always get a number out of this. Do not be alarmed. So, okay, we did the first two steps. Third step, uh, we need to finish designing the filter. So uh, just exactly as we did low pass filters before, we choose the appropriate transfer function using Butterworth polynomials for the desired response. We'll implement the filter using the Cower topology, either a known source resistance or a known load resistance, or we use the Sal and Key topology, which we'll talk about later. And then we'll calculate the component values that create a match with the normalized Butterworth low pass filter transfer function. So that's what we did on all these, you know, passive Butterworth low pass filter realization slides. So if we want the third order T for a known RL, we get, okay, we get RL is equal to one ohm, L2 is one half a Henry, C is four thirds of a farad, and L sub one is three halves of a Henry. So on slide 29, here we go. We actually choose omega C. So we know, okay, omega C min, capital omega C min is less than capital omega C, which by definition is just one because it's a little omega C over little omega C. It's less than or equal to capital omega C max. Or omega C min is this, omega capital omega P over the two nth root of 10 to the A max divided by 10 minus one. And, you know, capital omega C max is capital omega S over 2N root of 10 to the A min divided by 10 minus 1. If A max is 3 dB, omega P is just equal to omega C. Uh, otherwise, in order to choose what little omega C is, we can choose any sort of convenient value in the solved range. So we'll get, for example, something that's like, you know, uh, omega C divided by uh, one e th minus three, uh, and then uh, omega little omega C divided by three e minus three. Might as well choose omega C divided by two e minus three, uh, because that would be in between those two bounds. So that means uh, omega C equals two thousand radians per second. If that doesn't make sense, hopefully the example will clear things up in a little bit. We figured out what we need in order to choose omega C. And then during frequency scaling, all capacitances and ductance will get divided by a little omega C to place the 3 dB frequency correctly, as we will examine now. So the real high pass filter has all the frequency dependence relationships inverted from the low pass filter design. So if we swap the inductors and capacitors around, because you know whether you think impedances or admittances, uh, capacitors and inductors have the inverse relationship with respect to frequency, omega. It'll convert the low pass filter to a high pass filter that way. And we must divide the original omega C to define the normalized frequency in the first place. I am going to teach you how to read you know, the math right here. So it says, wherever there was a capacitor in our old low pass filter that we designed, it now becomes an inductor in the high pass filter that we want. So old capacitor becomes new inductor with a value of one over omega C times its old capacitance. Wherever we had an old inductor in our low pass filter, it becomes a capacitor in our desired high pass filter with a value of one over omega C times the old inductance. So this step is critical to getting the right design. So make sure you pay close attention to that.
Uh, finally, uh, we'll apply any magnitude scaling with a value k sub m as needed to match a reference resistance or to make realistic component values. Should be a fairly quick step. Do we have any questions right now or do we want to go straight into the example? <clears throat> Hopefully this is reinforcing what we talked about yesterday. Let's go into the example. So here's a high pass filter design example. So uh, it's basically like I told you, design a Butterworth high pass filter with a stop band from omega zero to omega s equals two pi times 100 radians per second. So omega s, or f sub s would be 100 hertz is what this is saying. A pass band from omega p is equal to two pi a thousand radians per second and then up to infinity. So the F sub P would be 1000 Hertz. A max is one decibel, A min is 30 decibels, and the filter interfaces to a source with RS equals 50 ohms. So as you learned, like it doesn't take many words to make you have to do a lot of work with the filter design. All you need to do is figure out if it's a you know butter or filter, if it's a high pass, low pass, and then we have our four brick wall specifications. And then we're told it interfaces to a source, so we need to match a source, not a load. And that kicks off the six step process we have here. So the first thing we need to do is convert it from a high pass design filter problem to a low pass design filter problem. So we'll define capital omega, normalized frequency equals omega C divided by omega. So that capital omega sub s is equal to omega c over 2 pi 100 radians per second. Omega sub p is equal to omega c divided by 2 pi times 1,000 radians per second. And omega sub s divided by omega sub p is just equal to 10. So the normalized frequency ratio right here, stop band to pass band is 10. Next thing we do is compute the order of our high pass filter as a low pass filter. So we plug in the values. So break out your calculator, make sure you know you, you probably want something a little nicer than a one or two line calculator to handle this much math in one go. Uh, 10 to the you know log of 10 to the three divided minus one divided by 10 to the one tenth minus one. Uh, close log all divided by two times log of 10 you get 1.793, or we choose n equals two. Uh, all we need is a second order filter here. Uh, apparently our brick wall specifications aren't too tight, uh, despite having you know a fairly tight A max bound. You know, these uh, transition band is wide enough that you know we we get fairly relaxed bounds. A min is also fairly low too for of stop band. So back to slide 25, we all designed the normalized low pass filter as before, doing the exact same steps. So we choose a Cower topology with a known RS, which is a second order L topology. You know, if, if we didn't have this designed already, we'd have to break out our Butterworth polynomials, you know, write down the transfer function and then equate the transfer function of the circuit to that of our, uh, you know, volt a voltage to voltage transfer function to that of our uh, Butterworth polynomial based transfer function. And we would have to equate terms to get, you know, RS equals one ohm, L equals one over square root of two Henry and C equals square root of two farads. On the exam, you will not be given uh, the uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I've, I think I've decided you won't be given any of the worked out butter filters. 
you'll have to solve for these types of values yourself on the Butterworth filter design problem on the final. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. I'll hopefully give you something that's not the fourth order circuit or higher. So after we finish designing this, we should get a circuit that looks like this at the top. This is our normalized low pass filter. So we've got a VN, RS equals one ohm. Then we got the filter section with L is one over square root of two Henry, 0 0.707, one Henry. And uh, C is equal to square root of two farads, 1.414 farads. And we take V out across the capacitor. You keep that in mind. So the next thing we do is frequency scale. And to do that, we need to figure out what our uh, omega C should be. So we get that omega C min is little omega C over two pi, uh, a thousand radians per second over the fourth root of 10 to the one tenth minus one. You get a value of 2.231 times 10 to the negative fourth times omega C must be less than or equal to one, must be less than or equal to 2.831 times 10 to the negative fourth omega C, which is, you know, omega, capital omega C max. So omega C must lie, uh, you know, you'd get this, this value less than or equal to one, less than or equal to this value by the inequality. Might as well just choose the value in the middle. So right, roughly in the middle is omega C is equal to one over 2.5 times 10 to the negative fourth. which would give us 4,000 radians per second. A nice value. It's convenient for us to work with. So the next thing we do is convert our element values using this. So wherever there was a capacitor before, it becomes an inductance with one over its omega C times its old capacitance. And the inductor becomes a capacitor with uh, its uh, one over omega C times its old inductance which since the inductance is already a reciprocal, it brings it to the top. We get that the inductance of the high pass filter should be 1.768.8 micro, well, 176.8 micro Henry. And that the, uh, uh, uh capacitance should be 353.6 micro farad. Then we magnitude scale by 50 to match the known RS. So RS will become 50 ohms as the originally stated in the problem. Uh, when we magnitude scale an inductance, it gets multiplied by 50. So we, we magnitude scale it based off of the, the new component types. So it becomes 8.8 .8 milli Henry to two decimal places, uh, or two sig figs, I should say. And then the capacitance gets divided down by a factor of 50, so it becomes 7.1 microfarads to two sig figs. So when we finally, you know, write down our circuit with our final answer, you know, make sure you draw your circuit correctly. Don't forget to label your sources. Don't forget to label your signals. Uh, don't forget units. All those things that will cost you points if you forget. You know, you get RS equals 50 ohms, C is 7.1 microfarads, L is 8.8 .8 millihenry. And just to check, is this a high pass filter? Well, at DC, nothing wants to get through this capacitor and the inductor would be a short. So there'd be zero output voltage because nothing gets through and this is basically shorted. And at, as we go towards infinite frequency, the capacitor basically acts like a short circuit. The inductor acts like an open circuit. So you just get whatever voltage is here straight out. So yeah, this is a high pass filter. Everything makes sense. All right, surely someone has questions now. Surely someone has a question.
Okay. Low pass filter design. So where does the we deviate? Well, you want to do the first step where you have to convert the high pass filter to a low pass filter design. So what you would do is you would start with this and say design a low pass filter with these. We don't need to convert. So we compute the minimum order basically directly from these things. You choose the topology that matches that. You would choose, would choose your frequency scaling uh, without having to use capital omegas. You would just get you know less than a bound and greater than another bound, choose a convenient value uh, as written back on this slide right here, slide 14. So it's instead of dealing with reciprocals, you, you get something that's a little bit nicer to deal with. And you wouldn't convert the impedances at the end. You would just uh, take you know, this value and then do your frequency scaling and your magnitude scaling. So instead of you know, uh, dividing by, uh, converting then dividing by omega C, you would just divide by omega C and then you would you know, multiply or divide by KM depending on if it's an inductance, resistance or capacitance. Hopefully you find that that's, you know, a, a more straightforward process. What other questions do we have? Done. I'll move on. So here's a new topic. We're going to switch gears from talking about passive filters to doing the exact same thing we did now with active filters. Again, you know, we'll, we'll get more into the reasons why, but having to deal with conductors, not ideal. Uh, though it turns out with capacitors, we can simulate what inductors would do instead. So consider a transfer function of purely real poles and zeros such that you know capital K is equal to the product of all these little KIs. So H of S is equal to K in the S minus Z1 to the Q1 power, S minus Z2 to the Q2 power, so on down the line till we reach uh, you know, something that's our last Z, you know, such that the sum of our Zs to the powers is the order of our numerator, usually M. And then we have over S minus P1 to the R1, S minus P2 to the R2, so on down the line until you get some last P uh, sub L, where P sub L to the RL power times all the previous powers gives you N, the order of the denominator. We can factor this out. So, uh, you know, assuming purely real poles, you know, We'll forget about the multiple, we'll divide out the multiplicities for now. So we'll get, you know, some K1 times S minus Z1 over S minus P1 times K2 S minus Z2 over S minus P2 and so on down the line. But if you look at this, this kind of looks like K1 times uh, a feedback impedance ZF1 over an input impedance ZN1 times K2 times ZF2 over ZN2, so on down the line. But you know you can rewrite this again. K1 is YN1 over YF1 times K2 over YN2 over YF2, so on down the line. Uh, just you know, remembering that emittance is one over impedance. Now, if you think really far back to the you know first two days of lecture, uh, lecture set one, topic one, the last equations resemble cascading inverting op amp circuits. So we should review the inverting op amp circuits to see, okay, do these things match uh, what we remember? So let's do an inverting op amp with impedance. 
So we'll have this input through a, an impedance Z sub in into the inverting terminal of the op amp, U, op amp U1. Uh, the non-inverting input is grounded. And we'll have this feedback impedance, uh, you know, negative feedback impedance Z sub F between the output and the inverting terminal. So the voltage gain transfer function, so we can think in terms of transfer functions now instead of just output over input. So H of S is V out over V in, in S domain, is equal to negative ZF over ZN of S. Or if we think in terms of events, it's negative YN of S over YF of S. And sure enough, you know, that matches these things right here. We'll just get a negative sign involved. And depending on the ratio, you know, we could get a constant multiple off rack. But we don't want to use inductors because they have non-ideal behavior that's more pronounced than that for capacitors or resistors. So we'd rather think in terms of the emittances in the last term. So recall that Y EQ at the equivalent emittance is going to be S times C plus G. Or if you like, don't like conductances, I think in terms of resistances, S times capacitance plus one over resistance. So this is basically a recipe for how to get each of these YN and YFs. You just think of the thing multiplying S as a capacitance and the sort of thing constant that's not in terms of S as one over a resistance. So let's see how we can build a transfer function with purely real poles and zeros. So we'll design an active low pass filter that implements the transfer function H sub one of S is equal to negative four over S plus six. So we'll match the form H of S equals negative Y in over Y F of S defined Y in is equal to four Siemens and then Y sub F is equal to S plus six Siemens. So we got to interpret this input admittance. There's no thing in front of S, it's just a constant term. So it's just going to be a conductance of four Siemens, thus a resistance of a quarter of an ohm. Interpret the feedback admittance as the parallel combination of a capacitance of uh, CF equals one farad in parallel with a conductance of six Siemens, with thus a resistance RF equals one sixth of an ohm, right? Admittances in parallel add directly. Uh, more of you were confused by that on the exam than I hoped. Remember, impedances in series add directly, and then the reciprocals add when they're in parallel. But for admittances, admittances in parallel add directly, and admittances in series have their reciprocals add together. Big idea that you, you cannot let confuse you. Then we magnitude scale to make these component values more practical as dealing with you know fractional ohms is not very fun and very hard to get parts for that won't burn up immediately. So let's say we want to make Rn equals to 10 kilo ohms. So and we'll get Km equal to four times 10 to the fourth. Rf is equal to 6.67 kilo ohms. And then Cf is going to be equal to uh, 25 microfarad. So our, our single pole uh, transfer function becomes this active low pass filter. So we'll get Rn equals 10 kilo ohms between Vn and the inverting terminal non-inverting terminal tied to ground. And then the feedback path, we have RF equals 6.67 kilo ohms in parallel with CF equals 25 microfarads. And this is actually a low pass filter as well. We're building towards the Salon key topology, the active low pass filter topology. Questions? No questions. Right. 
we specific the reason why we are doing active topologies is to avoid inductors. So that's why we're thinking in terms of emittances is because emittances naturally work with capacitors and conductors. Rather than if we think in terms of impedances, we'd use inductors and resistors. So we want to avoid inductors entirely. So that's why we're willing to go through the trouble and the expense of using active components where to you know, put power supplies up to the op amp. Uh, you have to you know, deal with the costs, you know, op amps costs you know, anywhere from you know, uh, half a dollar up to you know, $8 or something like that. Uh, you know, capacitors cost, you know, dimes, resistors cost pennies. So uh, inductors are more expensive. Inductors will cost you, uh, you know, dollars as well. So depending on the values, sometimes as low as like, you know, 20 cents. It, I'm generalizing very heavily here, but yeah, we're avoiding inductors entirely. So you wouldn't go through the effort of doing something with op amps and inductors. That would just be kind of silly. Unless there's some breakthrough in inductor technology that's eluded us for the last 150 years. So let's do an active low pass filter of two real poles now. Ooh, getting exciting. So a second order filter. H2 of S is 40 times S plus eight over S plus six plus or times S plus 10. So we're gonna factor this transfer function into easily implementable parts. Uh, we like negative signs because these are inverting op amps. So we'll get negative four over S plus six times negative 10 S plus eight over S plus 10. So wait a minute, negative four S plus six was exactly what we had before in our first filter stage. So all that work we did before, we'll just keep it and ship it forward. Uh, the, we have this new term we have to work with. So we'll multiply out the numerator and we'll get that Yn of our second stage, Yn2 is 10S plus 80 Siemens. And then Yf2 is S plus 10 Siemens for the second stage. We'll interpret the input admittance uh, up here as a capacitance of 10 farads in parallel with resistance of 1 over 80th ohms. And the, we'll turn back the, interpret the feedback emittance as a capacitance of you know, 1 farad in parallel with a 1 tenth of an ohm resistor. And then we'll magnitude scale to make the component values more practical. So we'll also use this 4 times 10 to the 4 that we used before. So we'll get CN2 is 250 microfarads, RN2 is 500 ohms, CF2 is 25 microfarads, RF2 is four kilo ohms. So we bring it forward. We find that this stage right here is exactly the same as before. And then the second stage will have RN2, 500 ohms in parallel with CN2, 250 microfarads into the inverting terminal. Uh, non-inverting terminal grounded, and then in the feedback path from the output of U2 to the negative terminal of U2, we'll get RF2 is 4 kilo ohms, and CF2 is 25 microfarads. Ta-da! And this implements this second order filter that has a zero in the, in the, in the numerator. So as you can kind of see, the capacitors in the feedback path contribute to the poles. And the capacitors in the input path contribute towards the zeros. Obviously, you need the resistors as well. You can't just say alone that they make the poles and zeros. But you know the capacitors in the feedback path contribute towards the poles. Capacitors in the input path contribute towards the zeros. What questions do we have about this example? Nope, you can magnitude scale individually. Yeah. Because if you think about what's happening, remember magnitude scaling 
for this, uh, you know, we're interpreting this as a voltage in voltage out transfer function. Magnitude scaling does not change the transfer function at all. So when you multiply two transfer functions that don't change, the end result is a transfer function that doesn't change. So you can magnitude scale individually. That's because we're doing voltage in, voltage out, or a current in, current out type of transfer function. If, you're, if your transfer function was just an impedance or admittance, you wouldn't be able to get away with this. Any other questions? Hearing no questions, I keep lecturing. Well, oh, we could keep doing this forever with real poles, but eventually we'll find ourselves limited. You know, unfortunately, you can have quadratic terms in the denominator, which lead to complex poles. So whether they're imaginary pole, purely imaginary poles, or they're complex poles, we have to be able to handle them in order to make a resonant filter. So we're going to create resonance without inductors. Ooh. Something that I, I that might you know seem to contradict what I said earlier, but like I said, the op amp is really simulating what the inductor would do. So we're going to ignore the case of complex zeros in lecture. That's something that you can investigate on your own time. Uh, complex poles is what we're going to focus on. So a second order low pass filter has a transfer function of the form, what we investigated at the start of this lecture set. H of s is equal to k over S squared plus two sigma P S plus omega naught squared. Where sigma P is the attenuation, omega naught is the uh, natural frequency and K is some overall gain. The roots are gonna be at S one two equals negative sigma P plus or minus J omega D where omega D is equal to square root of omega naught squared minus sigma P squared. So no amount of inverting amplifiers are going to help us implement this transfer function. We need something brand new, a brand new way of connecting the op amp called the sal and key topology. Some people say sal and an key, but I think that just is too many words. So I'll just call it the sal and key topology. Uh, this is important. And, you know, this is going to be necessary for, you know, making active filters. And hopefully you think our we, we went over the cases of poles back. We talked about the inverse Laplace transform. You know, you can have real, real repeated, imaginary or complex. If this handles imaginary and complex, we've handled all cases. So this is all we absolutely need in order to implement a, an arbitrary transfer function, uh, you know, ignoring the case of complex zeros, like I said. But, you know, certainly for any denominator with the poles, we can implement any denominator. So behold, the true sal and key filter topology. So what we have is an input that goes into R1, hits a point B, then hits R2 and feeds directly into the inverting input. We have a capacitor C2 at the non-inverting input uh, to ground at point A. Point B is part of a, I guess, positive feedback type loop between uh, C1 and the output. B, you know, between B and the output is C1. And then part of our negative feedback, we have uh, RA between the output and the inverting terminal and then RB to ground. So if you were to work out the transfer function for this and it would be a pain, but you can do it. You know, remember your uh, ideal op amp conditions, you know, no current into these terminals. Uh, these have to be at the same potential and whatever current comes out of here is whatever it needs to be. So you don't want to write a KCL equation exactly at the output. So you would get K over R1, R2, C1, C2, all over S squared plus quantity one over R1, C1 
plus one over R two C one plus one minus K over R two C two times S uh, one over R one R two C one C two where K is our non-inverting gain one plus R A over R B. This is a little bit much. So what happens if we make K equal to one? Well, this term would disappear. This would become a one. Uh, and that just means, you know, R A is zero and R B is infinite. So we can just whoop things around. Oops. So R A becomes zero means we're shorting between the output and the non-inverting terminal. There's no connection between the non-inverting terminal or the inverting terminal and ground. And we can flip the C1 up towards the top and we get something that looks like this. So this has non-inverting gain K equals to one. And we get a much simpler transfer function. So we get one over R1, R2, C1, C2, all over S squared plus one over R1 parallel R2 times C1. You know, the control is the pole. And then plus one over R1, R2, C1, C2. The solid key filter topology made simple, or at least simpler. So you got to get used to this feeds into the non inverting input. Most of the action happens with the non inverting input. We have direct negative feedback between output and the non inverting terminal. And then we have this capacitor that goes to point B between the resistors, and this capacitor right at the not a non inverting terminal to ground. A little bit hard, but definitely take your time, stare at this, learn it, absorb it, love it, appreciate it, care for it, all those sorts of things. Now, there are more fancy ways to get by with one op amp and make a third or fourth order filter, but we don't cover those in class for some reason. So, um, yeah, so say you want to do a third order filter with three capacitors and one uh, op amp, there is a way to do that, or even four capacitors, one op amp, there is a way to do it. We don't cover it in class. You just need to know there's a way. If RB is now zero, why isn't the negative terminal grounded? RB is not zero, RB is now infinity. So an infinite resistance is an open circuit. More questions? Let's do an example. So design an active low pass filter that implements the transfer function H3 of S is equal to 1000 times S plus eight over S to the fourth plus 22 S cubed plus 181 S squared plus 760 S plus 1500. So we'll factor this transfer function into easily implementable parts. Uh, go ahead and break out your uh, rational root theorem or just kind of know where we've been heading so far. And we'll get, wait a minute, we get H3 of S, that's a typo. H3 of S is equal to negative four over S plus six, something we implemented before, times negative 10 S plus eight over S plus 10, something we implemented before, times 25 over S squared plus six S plus 25. So repeat the work we did for the previous examples to uh, implement the first two filter stages. So these two are implemented as is. Now, if the sign were incorrect, say we needed a negative one out here, we would add an additional stage with R and K equal to R of K, just a regular inverting op amp with gain of negative one, but that's unnecessary here. So we would add a, a, a sort of zero stage to do that. Now we match the form H of S is equal to one over R1, R2, C1, C2 to find that this is equal to 25 uh, second squared. 
and one over C quantity, one over R1 plus one over R2 is equal to six seconds for the third stage. So we've got two e equations in four unknowns. That's not the way we like it. So we get to choose two things arbitrarily. So uh, your book likes to choose the resistances. So we'll choose R1 equals five ohms and R2 equals five ohms. So now we're down. Now we got four equations and four unknowns we can solve. So we'll get C1 is equal to 1 15th of a farad and C2 is equal to 3 125ths of a farad. We'll magnitude scale to make the values more practical. So uh, how about we choose Km is equal to 2 times 10 to the third. So R1 and R2 are both 10 kilo ohms. C1 is equal to 33 microfarads and C2 is equal to 12 microfarads. So we did R1, R2, C1, C2, but we've already kind of used those. So we'll change the reference designators that we use to refer to these capacitors to build the complete filter. And remember, since we're multiplying stages together, they're cascaded one after another. The order is unimportant, but I'll present it in this order right here. So we still have R1, RN1, 10 kilo ohm, RF1, RCF2. We'll have RN2, CN2, RF2, CF2 from before, if you two. And then for U3, we'll have uh, R3 is 10 kilo ohms, R4 is 10 kilo ohms, C3 is 33.3 .3 microfarads, C4 is 12 microfarads. So from in to out, we get this, which implements this fourth order low pass filter with a zero. So this Sal and Key topology low pass filter was the original course motivation. So if you remember back to lecture set zero on the first day, I was like, how do we possibly analyze a circuit like this? Well, now we have all the tools needed in order to do so. So we, we've come more or less full circle. I showed you a scary circuit and now we know how to analyze it. There's still more to this course. There's four slides uh, and uh, all of lecture set eight. But that's about as far as I want to go today. What questions do we have? Step three of slide 43. Ah, so say we had an overall negative one up front. So we would need something that's negative, negative. So we have a negative, negative, and a negative because these are all inverting amplifiers. And the way our, our sal and key topology works is it's a non-inverting topology. So there's no way to get a negative one from it. So in order to get a negative one, you would have to just throw in an additional stage. That's literally just R in one is 10 kilo ohms and RF or I guess R in zero is 10 kilo ohms and RF zero is 10 kilo ohms, no capacitor at all. And that would just invert the sign and give you an overall negative one if you needed that. Does that answer your question, AJ? Yep. Confused on the four matching, okay. So if we go back here, so we have, th this is the, our non-inverting sound key or, or sound key filter topology with K equals one. So we have this right here, which looks like one over R1, R2, C1, C2, one over R1, C1, C2, and then one over R1 parallel, R2, C1. So this form matches this form right here. So we can use that to solve for values, component values, after we choose two values. Any more questions? I mean, being able to design it is probably the more important thing. You could analyze it stage by stage if you had to analyze it, but I'd say the design aspect is the more important aspect. You would you'd always simulate something like this in practice because it's complicated enough. 
now it's always good to have the engineering knowledge to be able to figure out what's going on but you know you would definitely break out a simulation in practice okay i guess before i let you go quick announcement uh i've been kind of teasing this uh, as it goes along but it turns out i will not be teaching this class ever again so uh, they already have other people to fill this class teaching responsibilities in future semesters. So uh, it won't be me. Uh, so, you know, I'll have all these materials saved up, but unfortunately no one to really give them to. So if you have people you want to share them with in the future, go right ahead. Um, make sure these things live on if it's helped you at all. Um, other than that, you know, have a good rest of your day. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. You're welcome. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs>